Greetings from all of time, futures and past, to those who take the time to read an old man's words. Words that have taken many lifetimes together and much pleasure to have held. Passing from lifetime to lifetime as a curse to awaken without the memory of what has taken place. Until I stumbled upon an old tome in a monolithic monstrosity that covered the forgotten land of Shambhala. Towering over hollowed earth where many pilgrimages have ended. Forgotten that is to the mind of men, but not to the keepers that have vowed, binding themselves with those old words of power to forever pass on the knowledge to one who has found, which was never lost. From the moment my journey began, lifetimes ago, to the writings of these last words, I bid to you my personal journal of An Alchemist's Journey in Scent. Chapter 1, Egypt, Abnub, 1706, Frankincense and Myrrh. It has finally happened. Father has angered me for the last time, always saying how I'm wasting my time studying the ancient arts from the one God, saying this is a waste of my time and that I should go out and play with Ali and Hadid by the river. I don't want to play by the river. I want to study the ways of this world and to see what I feel can be. My father calls this foolishness and chastises me, it seems, now almost daily saying that I will find myself in trouble if I don't do what is accustomed of me to do. He doesn't know, but I feel that I am beyond the old archaic ways of bravery and values that lead one to not think past as far as one can see. And in these doom-filled lands, it isn't far. He thinks that I seek trouble, but in fact I seek treasure, one that can only be found deep within the heart. Why does Father worry so much? As it is written, what will be, will be. In the meantime, I have finished packing. I have said my goodbyes to mother, father, and brother. And only thing to do now is to pick up some fresh bread from the Greek breakery down the street. Pita, they call it. And it is very similar to Ish Baladi, which is our native bread. But there is another reason why I'm visiting this bakery in particular. His daughter, El Peace, her name means the personification of hope. And it is amazing how much hope she has given me when I'm feeling down about the way everything is going. She is one of the only reasons why I will stay here, but even she knows I must follow my heart. As I enter the bakery, her father says what is customary of our ways, As-salamu alaykum, and I replied, Wa alaykum salam. After picking up a few pitas, I asked was El Peace around, and he said that she's been gone a few hours on a trip to El Hammam to pick up some ingredients, and she'll be back a bit later. As is and was disappointment because I would have enjoyed seeing her before I embarked on my journey. As I walked out and toward the docks, guess who I see walking toward me? El Peace. She was in a hurry to get back to her father, so we spoke for a moment about the fact I'm about to leave. She says she felt it from the goddess, and that is why she hurried back and wore a perfume just for me. Mother said that if I wore it, it would bring spiritual insight, and so I wore it for you. Just so when you are traveling, you can remember me when you anoint your wrists and neck, and may it bring insights on your journey to keep you safe. As we said our goodbye, and as I head to the dock to pay my fee to board, I must not forget I will always remember El Peace by her insights that she showed me and the main ingredients for this oil shall be frankincense and myrrh. Chapter 2 India Nandi Divi 1711 Rose of the Mountain It has been quite a few years since an entry of any worth. I have met many different types of people, some as old as the days are long. From the old people of Sumar, whose skin is as black as coal, and whom talk about a god who seems to have very strange fetishes. To the giants of Afghanistan, who stand over nine feet tall and say in their old dialect that they are the descendants of the one true god. 
but some of the more outwardly mystical people thus far in my journeys have been the yogis of India, specifically the yogis I actually walked up on in the mountains of Nandi Devi. I have been journeying at this point on foot for about three months and went sometimes a week or more without seeing a living soul. I would have never believed that this journey that I've spoken of to my father those years ago and the many scenes that went through my imaginative mind would actually be in full effect in the flesh. I would be lying to myself if I said I haven't had the thought to quit and just turn around. When I met the yogis, they were drinking some foul-smelling tea, and it is said that this is the only nourishment they have had for weeks, as many of their hair limbs were longer than I am tall, and they weighed less than a baby calf. They were in good spirit. As the night went on, they told me stories of their lives they once lived amongst the lost in the cities, and others explained how madness drove them to a state of isolation. But then, one of the oldest amongst the yogis looked at me with a look as if I and he were looking through a mirror and seeing the opposite's reflection. He knew, he knew that I longed to see what the spirit of the world has told about the hidden crevices that the power of spirit dwell within all that can hear the call. He knew that I have heard it, and I knew that he has lived it. At that moment, he raised his hand, and the others fell silent, and he spoke in a tongue I have never heard, more like a vibration of syllables that the world has forgotten. As he spoke this tune of words louder, some of the others joined in, each singing a specific tone. Next thing I knew, I felt as though a knife was piercing my skull. A golden light took over my vision wholly, and the next thing I knew, I was standing in the middle of a field with fruit trees everywhere. Blue skies with one, two, three, four, five, six, six suns in the sky. The brightness was so intense I could barely open my eyes. Someone behind me touched my shoulder and as I turned he spoke to me not words out of mouth but words out of mind. He stated that I have been briefly allowed to awake but now I must go back to sleep and I now know a truth but there are many more to learn as I am only a lower initiate and must pass many tests before I will see what I seek. I nodded. As my eyes closed down to blink, they came back up and I was laying on my back. I was back in the camp, but there was no one around, not even the fire the yogis had going, which was brewing their tea. It was absent. But it was an omen what I was to witness next. In the spot where the fire was to be, there was a beautiful red rose in full bloom. These types of roses are not native to these areas, and why would one be up in the mountains where grass barely grows? I know. To remind me of the dream that I live, to remind me of the beauty that awaits me, and more importantly, the magic that dwells within those centers of my soul. I shall make a new formula, and its main ingredient shall be of this rose, this magical rose, of the mountain. Chapter 3 Nepal, Kokana, 1713. A Serpent's Tale. Music playing loudly, unworldly sounding flutes with drums, non coherent screaming and chanting. The serpent of the divine is awakened within all of us. The serpent lives amongst us as his own. We are his own. The serpent shall rule once again as before. Once again as before, once again as before, as has been foretold. Chant it profusely over and over. As the shamans sat in chairs swaying with candles lit, serpent drawings and glazed over looks that obviously tell that they are not fully here nor there. This has been going on since I arrived in Kokana, Nepal, about two weeks ago. The ceremony is that of the rising serpent one that I have heard of while in India two years ago. The story tells of a time when upright walking serpents were amongst the first type of man. This man was different than the man of today in spirit, mind, and form. These serpents used man as slave and man looked at the serpent as God. They have went by many names in history, Dracons, Archons, and many others, but the tales all say the same. 
They look at man as a vessel to be used and then thrown away as a child does with an overplayed toy. They mingle with man and have left lineages amongst the people until the day they return. And as faithful servants, they shall dwell in the great hall of Yordola, being the gateway between the serpent gods and man. It leads for a great story, but these stories, no matter what land I visit, tend to always lead to a horrific end of the humans who have aided in those who they try to keep from ascending. Ascension for men to rise in spirit to the heavens it seems most of these gods and jealous men are most afraid of, and they're willing to sacrifice millions, even billions, to prove this point. I have been up now for over 120 hours, the shamans more than 336. It is said at the 120 point I would not be able to tell the dream from the awake state, and this through chanting could open the pathways to Agartha. Well, I must say, I cannot tell if I am awake nor asleep. Only that I chant a harmonic tone that I say on my travels, and the more I say this, the more I seem to be going in and out of consciousness. I cannot believe my eyes at this point. Am I seeing what the townsfolk see when they look at the shaman? The shaman all look like serpents swaying back and forth in their chairs. They, as one voice in one movement in this moment, spoke. Un Anuk, Una Anuk, Un Amalatuk, Un Anuk, Una Anuk, Un Amalatu, Un Anuk, Una Anuk, Un Amala, Umu, Umu, Umu. These words seem to put all in hearing distance, including myself, into a daze which I cannot fully comprehend. It is like they, being the architects of this body, have pushed and pulled add it and subtract it where they need it to as they see fit. As the etheric surgery took place, I was given a brew that smelled strongly of nutmeg amongst other ingredients. I am happy at least it didn't smell bad. As I looked into my moving reflection in the cup of this strange brew, I looked at the events that brought me to this point in my journey. Is this not what I wanted to see? Is this not one of the many experiences in the back of my mind I wish I could have, no matter the consequence? For the sake of gaining the wisdom, I turn my face to the sky and pour this concoction directly into my mouth without restraint. And just like a levee that gives way from the pressure of a raging river, my mind has given way to the sayings of the serpent. Un Anuk, Un Anuk, Un Amalatuk, Un Anuk, Un Anuk, as I faded out of consciousness. When I awoke, fully aware of my senses, I lifted up and hit my head on what I thought was the ceiling, but how could this be? So I lifted with all my strength, moved the ceiling aside, and sat up to find myself in some type of burial chamber. There were many others in a state of Anuk a state of oneness with serpent. For what purpose, I entirely do not know, as I straddle along the wall to open the door, down a narrow hallway, then outside, I notice that I have been dressed in all white with embroidered symbols. From the position of the stars in the sky, even during this daylight hour, it seems I have been away from myself for over 12 years. What has happened during these 12 years, I can only imagine. I went back to the inn, into my room. My clothes were folded nicely as if I knew I would be ready to leave at this exact moment. There is a strong aroma in the room. On top of my clothes, a brownish ball, upon further inspection, showed that it is nutmeg at its most fragrant point. As I take this nutmeg and inhale deeply, its aroma tells me the secrets of the past tells me of my journey that I have yet to have. Mmm, such a delicate, refined aroma. I shall make an oil from this to remind me there is more to this world than what is shown through the senses. What is shown to the senses is only a small fraction of what is actually happening around us. And when I need to see what is not being shown directly, I shall anoint myself to receive the message. Un Anuk, Una Anuk. Mm, 
Chapter 4 Tibet Current Position Unknown 1732 A Nude Beginnings I have been traveling in and close to the borders of Nepal and Tibet for a few years. Then, as many times before, I was moved etherically to go to another location because it was yet another lesson to learn. This lesson would take me to the deserts of Xinjiang. I decided that I would cut through Tibet instead of going the way of northern Nepal to India. I anointed myself with the serpent's tail and began my journey northward. The serpent alluded me to a tree that had a symbol carved into it that looked like a question mark. I knew that this journey would be not what I expected. Traveling the high altitudes of Tibet with its mountainous terrain has taken a toll on my legs, where some days I spend just looking over and through the forest, listening to the stories the world has to tell. In these areas, you rarely see another human scurrying about, but you have the sense that you're being watched by the natives that still inhabit these areas. As it is told, many have entered these lands never to be seen again. I know in fact that they know of the serpents of the world, and because I have been through the ritual, as long as I stay focused on my path, I shall be left alone. As each day begins to blur into the next, sometimes I become overwhelmed with the sheer size of this forest. Am I walking in circles? I question myself periodically. But I couldn't be as long as I followed the path of the sun and stars as I have up until this time. But yet it seems the stars and the sun are plotting to keep me here. Let me keep my mind focused. I am used to going days, sometimes weeks, without eating a meal that fills the belly. I am accustomed to hearing my body cry out for nourishment. I drink teas from the herbs I find and sometimes eat the insects I find under hollowed out trees. I imagine if I had a mirror, I would not look too far off from the yogis of India, except bald. It has been a long time. It is a fascinating observation to see how the animals react to seeing one who is not or is no longer civilized. One who has taken to the wild, whether it be for purpose or slaughter. They seem to understand that they are no longer different, as you recognize internally yourself. My clothing has become ragged, skin hardened, my voice toned. I no longer see with the duality of my physical eyes, but with the clarity and oneness of the spiritual one. As I walk toward a mountain range, which I believe is the last which drops into the desert of Xinjiang, many past experiences flood my mind. The outspoken criticism of my father so many years ago, his demanding yet non-wisdom-based assumptions, the baker's daughter, El Peace, with her caring heart, my friends in the village, the mistakes and triumphs that have one by one brought me to this point in my life which has put me on my knees. I fall face first to the ground. A loud thump echoes through the mountains. Blood runs down my cheek and across my forehead. I have been running on the engine of spirit but the gears of flesh have been neglected. Am I, on this journey now, about to leave to the place of the six suns? Is this where my journey ends? A tsunami of tears break the rigid facade, which is an older man's face. The wallows have turned the sky cloudy. A storm approaches. I turn over and look up at the sky, which seemed like an eternity, until my spirit became unleashed from flesh. I yearn for this release. In fact, I am tired of being here. It has been over 24 years since I left home on this journey. 24 years of fascination and intrigue of pain and learning. I write with my last bit of strength the forbidden symbol of the serpent of Amalatuk. I pray forever you are, forever you will be, and forever it is. Please see that I have only longed to do what has been gifted upon me, the gift of adventure and the love of spiritual conquest of self. I have endured on this path, sometimes making mistakes as I go, but no, my heart has been as gold, impure in ore. 
and over the years the impurities have been chipped away. Thank you. And in my final breath I spoke, Un Anuk, Una Hanuk, Un Amalatuk, Un Anuk, Una Anuk, Un Amalatu, Un Anuk, Una Anuk, Un Amalatuk, Un Mu, Un Mu, Un Mu. Rainbow colors filled my peripheral, then took over my vision entirely. I see the earth from far away with a sheer cover over her. Then I felt myself being slammed back. I opened my eyes to see complete darkness. Where am I? I lifted my head to feel it clunk against something. I used all of my strength to move what is above me. No. No. This is impossible. It cannot be. I am in the burial chamber where I raised myself from before. This is impossible. There are still others here sleeping in a state of Vanuk. I even see an open burial case from which I opened before. As I find my way walking next to the wall, down again that narrow hallway which led to a door, as I opened it I found myself outside with the heat of the sun on my face. As I walked out down a path that was over one with bush and trees, which obviously has been unkept for some time, I come out into an abandoned village. What is going on here? Only part of the village that was not overgrown with nature was directly in the center where a carved image in stone of two intertwined snakes. Infinity, eternity, everlasting was carved beneath this stoned image. As I walked to the inn that I once stayed at in town, abandoned, I walked in the room I stayed previously. There was a set of clothes, a satchel filled with herbs, a dagger, and dried fruit in a message scrawl that stated, Infinitely yours. Signed, your servant. So many questions. Before I begin my journey anew, I shall make an oil as one I have not made before, one that represents this anew state. It shall be called Anewed Beginnings. Thank you for listening. This concludes the audiobook of An Alchemist's Journey in Scent, and I personally would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to one of many stories in my journal. Allow me to leave you with this. Follow your dreams, and do not allow anyone to sway you from it. Until our next meeting in time, be well.